Welcome to Counterpoint. I'm David Clement, filling in for Tanya Granick allen While there is a lot to talk about uh, in the world of Canadian politics, there are some interesting political developments happening with our neighbors to the south. In the lead up to US midterms, many are forecasting that the Democrats could be in a position to lose control of both Congress and the Senate. Are the Dems slated for monumental losses? If so, why are they losing the support of the American electorate? And what impact will this have on the 2024 presidential election? Joining me to discuss this is Adam Korzanewski. Thank you, Adam, for joining us on CounterPoint. Thank you for having me, David. So the midterms are not very far away. There's a lot of uh, headlines in regards to the direction or the ways in which the wind is blowing. Um, what is the latest polling or what is your view on how the midterms will shake up uh, Republican versus Democrat? Yeah, so one of the key problems for Republicans going into this election is even though they have the momentum, is just where the seats are aligned, right? So in the United States' system, uh, population uh, is uh, arranged differently for each of these uh, congressional seats. And right now, there's only looks like to be a narrower majority for the Republicans than they expected um, that will be coming out of this election. So normally, when you have such high inflation, as well as uh, such intense uh, dislike of the current president, you would normally see like a huge bounce back for uh, the opposition party. However, we're just really not seeing it in the kind of ways that really is important. Um, and there's a lot of weakness in the Republicans, despite likely uh, achieving a majority uh, in the Congress next year. And, and so you mentioned on, on the Republican side some of their limitations, where the votes are, where the, the congressional districts are, and what's up for grabs. Um, but underlying that is, is some irritation both with the president and Democrats more generally. What do you think are some of the root causes? You mentioned inflation, but what, what are some of the root causes of that, that frustration or irritation with the, the Biden administration, which obviously filters down into congressional politics? Yeah, absolutely. So the first year of the Biden administration wasn't seen as very successful, predominantly because of uh, COVID restrictions still in place and some of the, our deeper blue um, blue is Democrat in the United States, are, are more urban um, uh, areas where t uh, voters tend to be much more Democrat leaning. Um, so there's a there's kind of a softness with the Democrat base because they haven't really gotten a lot of their agenda done. However, um, you know, it's always about the economy with some, the midterm elections. You know, Republican Party is a party of spend less, tax less. And predominantly, um, a lot of Americans are feeling the crunch with this energy squeeze but also the uh, huge amounts of inflation. You know, the United States had been seeing record inflation since, uh, compared to, uh, I guess, for the last about 40 years, I'd say. Um, and so, you know, that's a huge, huge weakness for any incumbent president and, and the uh, po uh, party that's in power. Yeah, I mean, the, the reality on the ground, I think for a lot of people, it feels very much like it's, a, it's the economy stupid moment. Um, how better can Republicans seize that beyond the limitations you described? Is there something more that can be done for them to capitalize? Abs oh, absolutely. So we have the part of the problem with the Republican Party is they've become more, so myopically focused on inflation, right? Um, inflation probably has hit a ceiling and it's boomeranged a little bit down. Um, and but it's still at real at highs and energy costs are still high, but they've gone down recently. You know, it's a secondary effects that the Republican Party really needs to be running on, which is being tough on crime. And uh, what, that's one of the things that the Biden administration has done is at least done a, an, a public relations effort to look like they're trying to fund uh, federal police um, at a much higher level, even though that doesn't really impact street crime. Um, the Republicans actually have had no uh, messaging on this uh, consistently. You know, you have some candidates here and there who are kind of taking a lead on it, but by and large, it's been absolute uh, radio silence from the party as it, itself. How much do you feel that that communication issue centers around the, the 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 lack of leadership, let's say, on the Republican side? Who is the voice of Republicans these days? Is it the former President Trump? Are there others who are emerging? There seems to be some gray area there. 
Yeah, it, it is the former president. And, you know, he is a, a grandiose party, whether he decides to run again or not. Mm-hmm. And he kind of dictates the tone. And, uh, you know, the Republican leader in the House of uh, Representatives in the United States is very, very, um, how should we put it, very soft when it uh, comes to his public displays. And we're back on Counterpoint. I am joined by former U.S. Tre- Treasury official Adam Korzenewski. Um, prior to the break, you were touching on um, maybe some soft politics in terms of c- congressional leadership for the Republicans. Can you elaborate on, on what that means? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the Republican leader in the House of Representatives is Kevin McCarthy of California. And he's a uh, you know, he, he once tried to run for Speaker of the House before when the Republicans had the majority last time, and he got stopped out by his own caucus, um, predominantly because he's seen as kind of a le- weak leader, even though he's been effective in the minority. On the other side of the coin is uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, of, uh, and he's the Republican leader in the, uh, the Senate. And, you know, he's a lot stronger on message, but, you know, he has a he has a situation where he actually has fewer races to contend with versus Kevin McCarthy does. And Kevin McCarthy has to have a stronger, more broad appeal message that appeals to independents across the country. And we're just not seeing it. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. The the uh, political issues of the day for, uh, for, for congressional leadership in Congress is different than the Senate. There are fewer races to focus on. And so it may be easier um, in the Senate to, to kind of narrow down that messaging. Um, on messaging, on the Democratic side, uh, some have posed that some of the, the leaking of support from the Democrats is a focus on faculty lounge progressive politics over pocketbook issues. Are we seeing that play itself out in polling? I don't think we're seeing it play out in polling. Uh, Democrats are fairly motivated, but you're absolutely right. The progressive base hasn't been really getting what they wanted out of uh, the Biden administration. And for a short period of time, uh, the uh, Speaker of the House, the Democrat majority leader, um, Nancy Pelosi, was playing this campaign of blame Biden on uh, some of the failures of early uh, legislative efforts. But, you know, that seemed to have tamped down and they seem to have gotten on message. Um, and they're really kind of making sure that they're uh, both preserving their left-wing progressive base, but also appealing to the moderates that actually helped uh, them get elect- uh, Joe Biden get elected in 2020. And, and on the, the note of President Biden, there were some rumors um, that, that folks inside the Democratic establishment were hoping uh, for him to step aside. I mean, he is... His age uh, is one. His, his popularity uh, in terms of the American electorate is another. Um, is there any reality to that? For, for me as an outsider, that seems like something that would be completely uncharacteristic. Uh, but do you see that as having um, any basis in reality? It would be completely uncharacteristic. Uh, Joe Biden has been trying to become president of the United States since the 1980s. Uh, but also he's uh, rebounded in the polls mm-hmm. and predominantly because he's been focusing on kind of that uh, bread and butter, coal face type politics, which is, you know, industrial uh, development, industrial policy. Uh, the things that uh, both he and uh, pre- former President Trump actually ran on. Um, and so he's delivering on that. Plus, uh, the discussion of alleviating student loan debt also has been um, uh, helping him in the polls. The, the thing you have to remember with this is that his vice president, uh, Kamala Harris, is a very powerful former uh, U.S. senator and current vice president, of course. Um, and she has a great PR machine. And, you know, she would love to be uh, president of the United States. The problem and the uh, and that's primarily for her to stop her chief rival for, from ever becoming the Democrat nominee, which is uh, current California governor uh, Gavin Newsom. So you. He- you really feel that Gavin Newsom is, is the, the anointed one in terms of um, next on, to, to head the Democratic ticket? And I only ask that because, uh, I mean, he faced a recall uh, initiative in his own state. There's a lot of grumblings about the, 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 the overall state of California, brownouts, drought, all sorts of, of issues there. 
um, is, is he the, the formidable enough to rise above those issues? So he's a candidate who is kind of as that Hollywood appeal who would be able to uh, really secure that left wing that um, in the uh, in the Democrat primary and kind of consolidate the power that'd be really necessary for him to uh, break into that top five. Mm -hmm. And someone like Kamala Harris has to figure out a way to basically prevent him from actually uh, ever contending with him in, say, 2028. Um, and so there's a huge amount of backstabbing going on here. There's a lot of political intrigue that's very esoteric that's going on. And, you know, part of it is the mainstream media doesn't want to talk about it precisely because they want to have access to these both these parties. You know, they yep. don't want to seem like they're having favoritism here. And we'll be right back. And we're back on Counterpoint. I'm joined by Adam Korzeniewski. Um, you were mentioning the, the kind of horse jockeying or, or politicking between uh, California Governor Gavin Newsom and, and Vice President Kamala Harris in regards to who's next. Um, there are some other names that, that are always in the mix. Uh, Pete Buttigieg uh, is one. Um, do you see any others rounding out what you described as that top five of who could be next? for the Democratic Party. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think, uh, you know, Secretary uh, Pete Buttigieg, uh, Secretary of the Treasury, or sorry, of the of Transportation uh, in the United States um, is probably a weaker presidential candidate moving forward. You know, he had his uh, time in the sun once and his position as a transportation secretary has been lackluster. Um, however, there's a couple uh, interesting picks that would be very powerful on the Democrat side, uh, at least uh, for appealing to independents. You have former uh, governor, or soon to be former governor of Pennsylvania, the current governor of Pennsylvania, Tom Wolf. Mm -hmm. um, Pennsylvania is a swing state in the United States. Um, you also have uh, Senator Mark Kelly, who's uh, a Democrat currently uh, facing a, a challenger this year in Arizona. Um, and and you, have a, you have a couple astronaut other. Mark Kelly, correct? That's right. Yes, yeah, that's, that's correct. The, uh, the senator from Arizona is a former astronaut. And there, uh, astronauts in the United States have this uncanny ability to win elections consistently. There's very few. Um, I don't think they've, uh, an astronaut has lost a general election in the United States. I think they've, uh, John Glenn once lost a primary, but, um, you know, that's kind of beside the point. The, so, like, like there, it's a very, he's a very strong horse with a, a great uh, political war machine. Um, you know, you also have a couple of these other swing state, uh, statewide elected officials that are kind of look chop at the bit, but those are two that I'd be very concerned about if I was uh, uh, Kamala Harris trying mm -hmm. to become president of the United States by 2028. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a very good one. I think Americans generally have a lot of respect for people who've left the planet. Um, <laughs> so, that's right. Uh, on, on the, the Republican side, I mean, there is the FBI investigation into former President Trump. Uh, how that's perceived, I think, depends on who you talk to. There's a lot in the very um, f further mega world, if we call it that, who, who maybe see this as, as politically motivated and it doesn't phase them. But is there really a viable route for Trump to reemerge as, as the nominee um, after losing to Biden once before? Absolutely. So he lost by only, you know, a few thousand votes in most of these swing states. And the, the way that the U.S. electoral system works is that uh, these swing states tend to have a lot of influence over who becomes the, the uh, president of the United States, just because these are like the margins are so narrow. Um, and, you know, in full, in full disclosure, I actually worked in the Trump administration. This is actually my commission behind me. Um, but, you know, if and when Trump does uh, become be is cleared of wrongdoing by the FBI or the Department of Justice, you know he does have a, a strong shot at going up uh, to be in the uh, Republican nominee again, and it'll once again be a very tight election between him and Biden. I think there's a both Biden and him are extremely polarizing, especially given Biden's most recent speech where there was no conciliatory tone towards um, you know the kind of the kind of person who would vote for Obama, Trump, and then Biden in the years consecutively like that, in elections consecutively like that. Um, so there's going to be a hard bifurcation of independence, I think. And it's going to be a very tight race between Trump and Biden if Trump does run. 
Um, there's also a uh, Republican governor of Florida, uh, Ron DeSantis, who's a, a strong contender for it. But there's there's actually a stronger bench than normal uh, this uh, this coming 2024 election. And it really depends on who actually wants to run. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, incumbent presidents do not lose. Obviously, there's a few examples, including yep. former President Trump. And so that's one of the chief concerns with all these candidates. So you, you said if uh, and when uh, Trump would be cleared, but what if he is not cleared? This investigation oh, his, continues on. That would, in your view, that would be the end of of his political endeavors. Probably, yeah, okay. absolutely. Like, um, there's nothing that stops in the Const United States Constitution. There's nothing that stops. Um, a president from ever running again, except for high crimes and misdemeanors. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, uh, other than the two terms uh, rule, but yep. um, there's there's not anything there that he has done or is accused of being done that fits under the very narrow definition of the U.S. Constitution's high crimes and misdemeanors. Okay. So, but he would probably have to step aside just uh, as a to be a uh, to remain his position as a, a political grandee. Yep. Yep. Okay. We'll get more into what's uh, what else is on the Republican uh, perspective ticket when we return. And we're back on Counterpoint. I am joined by former U.S. Treasury official Adam Korzeniewski. Uh, you mentioned Ron DeSantis as a, pot uh, a potential front runner. Uh, I've heard him described as um, a little more better, uh, a better tempered. Uh, version of Donald Trump who hits just enough notes to um, to to rally the the kind of strong conservative base, but with enough uh, in the middle uh, to not scare away independents. Do you think that's a fair assessment in terms of his possible route to uh, the top of the ticket in 2024? So yes, that's kind of a very um, uh, Republican insider. Uh, characterization. And I think that's kind of misses the mark a little bit about Ron DeSantis is that um, he he's won a, a competitive uh, statewide election in Florida, right? And uh, he has a very strong political team to do it. Mm -hmm. um, he's also uh, part of that old DC Republican um, neoconservative cadre, for lack of a better term, even though he's not one. And so he has broader appeal to the uh, Republican establishment as a as a whole, and he would be considered like a consensus candidate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, his record on uh, COVID nineteen is one of the best um, in the state in the country. You know, he um, he was one of the first states that uh, ended lockdowns across the state. We turned everybody back to business, and uh, you know, he's uh, really good at public relations. But you know, his big his big problem is that he actually doesn't have the national recognition that most people want to think he has. Um, and he, for the most part, he's he's uh, how he would be. He's incredibly polished to a point where it, it does not come off as authentic as he needs to be. And that's one of the things that uh, Trump really broke the mold on, which is it's kind of like in your face level of like yeah. clarity and authenticity. The and that's going to be a struggle for most of them. Yeah, the, the completely unvarnished politician is is kind of whether you liked him or not uh, was I think an accurate way to describe. The former president. Um, you mentioned that DeSantis may not have the national reach that people think. So who does? Who else is out there on the Republican side who could uh, have that national reach to climb their way up to the top of the ticket? So the next two years are going to really be determining who actually has that ability to climb to the top of the ticket. Um, if it's not former President Trump running and becoming the nominee, it's going to be a, a climb for every other potential presidential candidate to do so. Um, and really, you're going to start seeing that uh, really be decided who pulls out ahead and who falls behind within the, uh, the uh, 2023 as people start doing the uh, media circuit more and more. Um, you know, like one of the things that's a huge problem for some of these uh, pres potential candidates is that they actually have their literal identical clone, basically, um, it also wanting to run for uh, president. So. Um, I can get into the the potential candidates, but they all have this problem is that they're extremely regionalized. Yeah, I mean, other names that have been thrown out, Nikki Haley um, has been one, um, but it seems like, and you can correct me if if my understanding of this is incorrect, is that the Trump era was very much about one man, and that 
in some instances, limited the ability of others to create their own national brand. And so based on your assessment, would it be accurate to say that from when it is decided, or if it's decided that Trump's not running, that's when the game is really afoot for uh, these other Republicans to kind of build that presence that they maybe didn't have in the shadow of, of the bombastic former president. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, it's also like, for example, you have for someone like Nikki Haley, for example, the South Carolina governor, because of uh, laws passed during Reconstruction after the American Civil War, was actually extremely weak. Um, and running in her own, uh, also a statewide candidate um, or statewide elected official holder, Tim Scott, is also looking at the presidential thing, uh, election. So does some of these candidates don't even have their home states as uh, being best basically in their corner. So, you know, it's going to be a huge struggle for some of these people to rise out of uh, obscurity. And, um, you know, it's really going to also depend on um, how involved does the uh, former president want to get into the primary? Yep. You know, he could destroy people's careers with a single uh, whatever social media app he's on I, uh, now, but he used to be able to destroy people's careers with a single tweet. Yeah. So, yeah I mean, and if he it begs the question, does he not run and then play Kingmaker and the role that that plays? So thank you, Adam, for joining us on Counterpoint. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Well, I think it's pretty clear that uh, the U.S. Uh, political arrangement is ripe for some disruption. Could we see Joe Biden versus Donald Trump uh, for a second round? It's possible. Uh, or do both of those uh, individuals see themselves off the top of the ticket in 2024?